we're going to do what I believed will be the last in the series of learning to live in the miraculous. I want to go back and, and uh, reiterate just for a moment. I think the thing that, that, that I've done and presented here that's different than I have ever personally ever ministered within these bounds done or have I ever heard anybody do and that by no means means that well I think I've got something here that nobody else knows that's not what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say is that I realized early on in this series that God is truly going to permit us now to walk into these areas begin to teach within them begin to minister within them so that people can begin to live within them uh, knowing, and as we talked about, I think, I think in every one of the series, maybe with exception of the very first tape that we did, uh, the fact that we're made in the image of God. And if we're made in the image of God and we're made like unto Him, which we are, then we possess within our own being uh, the Spirit of God, which means that we have the capabilities of being able to act like God acts. And that means we have the capability of calling the fire down. We have the capability of the oceans to open. We have the capabilities of food to appear. We have the capability of water that's not good to become good and all the things that we've studied. I realize that we didn't touch everything by any means, but I think we got a good cross section of being able to begin to realize that, hey, this Bible was written to inspire us. The Bible was given to us so that we could understand that was an example or example, as the Bible says, unto us. In other words, that we could follow, we could trust the, that which had been done. Now, the, the sad thing that took place, obviously, through the generations is that we lost touch with the spiritual reality of who we are on this earth. And that's what's happened to us. We lost touch with that. I have said for years and years and years that God has always had men and women like me on this earth to perform mighty miracles and mighty healings because God did not want the people to, to absolutely lose complete reality of the fact that it still happens. And I see that now as, 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 I see it so clear now, and I realize what God was doing then, I realize what God is doing now, and I glorify God, the fact that I have the opportunity to stand in this hour, in this time, in the holy, in the holy place, and minister by the Rahakodesh, the things in which God is about to do on the face of this earth for this last and end time scenario which we now live in. Let's go into the book of John and the second chapter. I've got quite a bit to cover here tonight, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, try to get this done. If we don't, well, we'll just do another one. John 2, first verse. And the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And I've always marveled at that. And that shows you that there was a human side of this guy that's the son of God. Okay, or as this piece of flesh that came to earth as the son of God. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And isn't that just like a mother? <laughs> I love it. She knew it was his hour. She knew it was his time. She said, just do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the matter of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three uh, uh, firkins apiece, which is 20 to 30 gallon. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Now, of course, we know the rest of it. We know very well the rest of it, that, bless God, that the water had turned to wine. It impressed the governor of the feast, and they want to know why they say the best wine to last. Now, of course, the church has always said that it was non-alcoholic wine, and I'm here to tell you the church needs to grow up and smell the roses. That was real wine, had real alcohol content in it, and they really drank it, all right? And the fact of it is, it's like everything else. It's, it's, it's part of what the church has gotten themselves into. Do I believe in people being drunk? No, I don't. I, that, again, life is a balance. And if you can't learn to balance your life, then you're a mess. The fact of it is, wine, beer is not going to send you to hell. If the fact of it is, you're not going to get to heaven being a drunkard. That's what the Bible says. And if you understand that, you're fine. Now, that, I don't want to get off on that and you to miss the miracle, the, the miraculous that happened here. 
Do you notice when he filled those pots or had them to fill those pots up, he just simply told them, he said, he said now, he said, uh, uh, draw out now and bear or take it unto the governor of the feast. Take it under the, draw it out now and take it. Now they just filled them up, 20 to 30 gallon a piece, filled them up with water, and he said, now just take it out. Now, now here's the point I want to make to you. He didn't say, water, turn thyself into wine. He didn't say that. He didn't put his finger in it and then take it back out. He didn't look in it and say it. He just simply had them to fill the pots up. He said, now draw the water, take it to the governor, and let him drink. And that's what they did. The governor noted that it was the best wine that he had, he had tasted that day anyway and probably ever and probably never again did he taste that good of wine. But the fact of it is the miracle appeared. The miracle appeared. The miracle appeared. Now, it gives me, and I've said somewhat about it before, on this Passover that comes in the spring, I'm going to, the, going to do what God showed me probably 25 years ago. I saw sitting here in a vision in this church on this platform right here in front of this pulpit I saw a a water a container I had taken a anointed cloth and I had put it over the water container and we then took communion and it was wine and the Lord said to me he said and so shall it be on that day and I've told the people for years, I'm certain that you had heard me tell that story. And I think that probably anybody that's ever been around me has probably heard it because of the fact that I'd still not have, had seen it come around. I think, again, with revelation knowledge, as God brings that revelation knowledge to us, that is, then we know and understand the peace that we didn't have to do what we need to do with. Now, this, this Passover that comes wherever I'm at, and I may not be here. I, I'm being drawn pretty hard to, to a couple different places. As a matter of fact, to try to be there to, to be with that congregation for the first Passover that they would have ever experienced. But uh, wherever I happen to be, and I, you will be able to experience it here because I will do that here, but I'm going to set the wine, set the water, and I'm going to believe God to turn that water to wine for us to take, uh, for us to take communion. Now, Will that happen? It will happen because not to prove that I am a prophet of God. It won't happen, bless God, to prove that God is God. It's going to happen because I'm a prophet of God and miracles follow after me. That's the reason it's going to happen. It's not going to happen because God told me to do it. It's happening because I am speaking the fact that the water will turn to wine on the seventh day a Pesach, and it will take place. So, so you're going to get a chance to uh, to uh, see. And like I said, if I'm not if I'm not uh, here, then you'll sure know about it because I'm sure the people will be glad to to, to pass that on. So, uh, that, that, and I've waited years of, uh, to be able to see that uh, because I always thought, well, what a way that that would be. And and of course, I've I've had to go through a lot of changes myself. A lot of a lot of things have had to happen supernaturally in my life to bring me to the point of saying, all right, you know, then, then we're, we're going to do that. And somebody said, well, what if it doesn't turn to wine? Well, there isn't any question as to whether it's going to turn to wine. The question it always was, was the timing right in order for it, for God to have done what he wanted to do? And, and I believe without a shadow of attorney that uh, we have come to that place in time. Let's go to John, the eighth chapter. And I have one verse there that I want to use. John 8, the 59th verse, John 8, 59. And, and, and I want to use this because it, it's so interesting. Uh, and it says, then, then took they up stones to cast at him, at Jesus. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now you have to, you have to realize that now, how, how, let's think about, let's think about, uh, uh, what was that show? Star Trek. Okay, that show that was on TV and on the movies, you know, where they, they materialize and dematerialize and whatever that is. Uh, that w and, and I think for, for usage of this thing, that's probably the easiest way to, to try to understand it is that he actually went through the midst of them. They didn't see him and it wasn't because he didn't look like himself or he pulled his, his uh, tallit up over his head uh, so that he was hid. He passed through the midst of them. 
he passed through in another form. Now, we are again are entering into the time when we're going to see what I've called the translation, and I think that uh, rightfully so, but the Bible means even, uh, is going to come full turn or full blown uh, to the church and to the believers. And I'm, I guess I ought to start saying believers and be careful about the way I say church because it's not going to happen in the church. It's going to happen to believers. And, and bless God, as, as a believer, we're going to get in a position as these, these uh, plagues come, these judgments come, one after another as they're beginning, just now beginning to start to come to this earth, that I'm going to need to be places. In order for me to need to be places, I'm going to have to get there in some other means in the way that I'm going now, all right? Because there's not going to be airplanes, they're not going to be flying, and bless God, you're not going to be able to buy gasoline to go there by vehicle, so we're going to have to get into what? Translation. And people said, oh my, I just don't see how we can do that. Well, you just sit back and watch how we're going to do that, because we're about to do it. That is what, that is just part of what's going to go on. You are going to gather yourselves together, and the, the prophet will show up in the mist, and I will be there. I will deliver the message. You will hear the message. And then I will go, go back to where I'm going. It would be kind of a good deal because I can sleep in my own bed. I'm a big, big deal about sleeping in my own bed every night, you know. And, and uh, so I can go sleep back in my own bed, and the next night I'll go somewhere else or whatever God wants me to do. And he said, well, I don't know about that. Well, you don't need to know about that. You know, uh, let, let those that believe stand up and be counted. Let those that bless God that want to believe God understand that we're now at the hour and the time. The kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is once again at hand. And we're not, we are not dealing with granddad's church any longer. We're not dealing in a time and an hour when, when we're concerned about uh, uh, salvation. And you say, but we should always be concerned about salvation. Well, we have come through the time of what's called the dispensation of grace. We've come through the, the time of the Gentile age. And I'm here to tell you that those doors are shut, shutting, and they're shutting quicker and quicker than we'll ever imagine. And because they're shutting that quickly, it's going to be difficult because the judgments that are coming for the sickle to be put into the harvest and the things that need to be done to be done in the manner in which we've been doing them. Now, they're still going to happen. Don't misunderstand that. People are still going to be saved. Multitudes of people are going to be saved. But it's going to be in a different means in which we have ever seen it take place. Because again, we're not going to be able to get there and be there with those people in the manner in which we have once been there with them. Now, I, I, I think that you, again, have to understand after he rose, after Yeshua rose from the dead, after three days, now he told him, he said, touch, touch me not because I'm not yet glorified. He said, don't touch me because I'm not glorified. Now, he came back to them in another form, and we're about to get to that another form here uh, in, in the 21st uh, chapter of John. Turn with me there. He came back in another form, 20, 21, 5, 21, 5. And he said to them, children, have you any meat? They answered to him, no. Now, the fact of it is, uh, they, they didn't understand that to have been Jesus, but he was standing on the shore. And, and he asked them, had me? He said, no. Now listen, and he said to them, now they had, if you read on up through here, now they had feasted all night and caught nothing. Now you remember they did that once before, and bless God, and now here they are back in the same old uh, uh, bind that they were in, uh, in at, at once before. And he said, well, cast the nets on the, on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And what they do? They did, they hauled in a multitude of fishes. Now... The manifestation of the Spirit, you see yourself in a mirror. People see you as we believe that we are. But what we don't understand, and scientifically speaking, that we are made up of molecules. And the molecules of which we're made up of, our bodies are made up of, are ever-changing. They're, they're, they're changing. The bodies that we have because of what happened in the, in the garden with Adam and the decision that he made that wasn't very smart, bless God, changed, changed the absolute structure of those molecules forevermore. But they are still there. They were generated by God to cause your body to never age and to live forever. That's the way God structured it all. But because of the fall, or what we call the fall in the garden, 
that, that then began to degenerate, if you will. And then we found ourselves down to a point in time, and well, it went all down to 120 years, and it got down to 70 years that we had to walk on the face of this earth. And during that time, the molecular uh, structure making up our bodies became, a, 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 it got to the place where our bodies would begin to do what? Begin to get older and begin to uh, frailer. The bones aren't as strong, the muscles aren't as strong. But you see with God and the connection with God is that there is another person involved in this. The other person involved in this is the spirit of God that is in you. And with that spirit that's within you, changes. Now, you remember me talking about the two sets of laws. There's one set of laws that governs the molecular part of you. There's another set of law that, bless God, that governs the supernatural part of you. And we're going to learn to be governed by the supernatural side and not the natural side, okay? We're going to, we're going to learn to do that. Now, I need to tell a couple of stories here, and, and as time uh, uh, begins to tick away on the, the old clock, I've got to kind of be careful here, but I want to get these stories in. I want to talk about the time that I had been in South America, and uh, I, I started back, and I called Donna on the phone, and, and Donna said to me I was in Barbados, and I was spending three or four days there because I wanted to go around to some of the churches and minister, some of the ministers that I had ordained and brought up into the ministry, and so I, so I did, and, and I called her, and she said, you can't, you're, you're not I'm not going to be able to get home. She said, there's a hurricane that's going to come in and going to be in Miami about the time that you get there. Well, Stephen had already told me, he said, you know, you're not going to be able to get to Miami tomorrow because he said, he said, well, he said, you're going to get there, but he said, you're not going to get out of Miami. That hurricane's going to come in there and do it. And I, I said to Stephen, I said, Stephen, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I'm a prophet of God and I'm going home. I'm sleeping in my bed tonight or tomorrow night, and I said, that hurricane's not going to stop because I'm going to move that hurricane. I said, pray with me. And Stephen, he said, well, I'm not, he said, you pray, and I want to listen. And I started praying, and, and I said this. I said, Lord God, as the prophet that you called me to be, I came and went to South America. I did your bidding, and I'm going home. That hurricane is in my way, and because you've given me authority over everything that's on this earth, that's in this earth, that's above this earth, or below this earth, I take that authority in the name of Yeshua. And I command that hurricane that's headed toward Miami to move just a few degrees to the north and, and, and just enough that it'll get past where the weather will be fine for me to get in and out of Miami. And I said, amen, and, and blessed is your holy name, in Yeshua's name. Stephen looked at me and Stephen said, is that it? And I said, yep, that's all, that's it. That's all, all that's all it needs. About an hour later, Steve come and knocked on the door, and he said, you've got to come and see this. Now, he said, now, here's where this thing was headed. And they showed this thing, and they said, now, after you prayed, one hour later, he said, they've now said this thing's making a track. It's going north. It's going to miss Miami. You're going to be able to get in there, and you're going to be out, get out of there. Now, I, I told Janelle, we were sitting here, and I was talking about that this evening here before service, and I said, you know, if there was people who actually knew what I did, and, and I was the cause of doing the, that and the destruction that came to their area that would have been naturally into the other area. They might, they may be mad enough to come and put a knot on my head, but the fact of it is the prophet was going home. Now, again, that is a shadow and a type of what God is bringing into the, into the realm of those that will dare to believe in these last days. It has nothing to do, but it has had everything to do with being a prophet up until the time that we're now beginning to enter into. And it is a shadow for the church to be able to see and a church to be able to say, see, that isn't just something that we read in the book of Acts. That's the, the things that I, I have shared during this, these messages are things that I have seen, things that I have watched God do. I know I was in India and, and we, had, we ran out of a bottle of water and they said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I said, go, go get the water out of the, out of the canal. Now, folks, they, they bathe in the canal. All their sewage goes into the canal. Uh, bless God, uh, everything goes in the canal. And bless God, uh, the canal's a way of life. And they said, well, you, you know that water can't be safe. I said, go get the water out of the canal. They went and got the water out of the canal. And the Indian woman that was in charge, she said, I will boil the water. 
I don't know how much you know about that type of thing, but boiling the water is fine. But you can't boil that kind of water hot enough or long enough, bless God, because you couldn't get the fire hot enough to be able to boil it enough to bless God to do it. And all she could get to do it was get it where it was just, was just the water was just rolling. It wasn't boiling really, it was just kind of rolling, okay? And so, and so anyway, I, I, commanded, I commanded that water to be whole. I said, I, that water will be whole, and I sanctify it through the power and the name of Yeshua. And I said, and so let it be. And so they got that water cooled. I said, now put it, I told the guys, I had four or five guys with me, I said, put it in the bottles, and we're going to go take it to the crusade grounds. And they looked at me, and they said, we're going to take that water? I said, yeah. And they said, how do we know? I said, what do you mean, how do we know? I said, the prophet sanctified the water. Now, I don't know whether you understand uh, enough about koshering. A prophet can kosher anything, and which makes it holy, or it makes it uh, deemed in the eyes of, of God as such. And so prophets can do that. And so I said, I just koshered the water. I said, it's all right. So I just took a cup and I just reached down in it. I drank a big old cup of it. And I said, well, I said, now, if, if, if in fact, this stuff isn't uh, koshered, I said, then let me be the one to be sick. How will that be, fellas? Well, they bottled up the water, and, and bless God, the afternoon came. We went back to the crusade grounds. I preached, drank the water all the way through because it was 124 degrees in the, in the shade. And I drank the water, and I came back, drank the water. The next day, they went and got more water out of the canal. I blessed the water and, and commanded it to be whole in the name of Yeshua. And we drank it that day, and then the next day, they brought a bottle of water. Now, let me tell you something. There wasn't a one person that drank that water that had any kind of problem at all, any kind. Now... On any other, on any other, on any other occasion, that probably would have killed them, killed all of us. On any other occasion, it probably would have made us deathly sick. And at the least, we would have been using the restroom 24-7, okay? But the fact of it is, it didn't happen that way. It happened because why? Because there is, there is within the anointing of God the power of the anointing to be able to take those things which look to be, to call them as though they're not, and bless God, make it that way through sanctification and saying it be holy, it be pure in the name of Yeshua. And so therefore, we, we, begin, we begin to see again, God, you know, people always say to me, say, well, Brother Deckard, and I get a lot of emails saying, Brother Deckard, we need to know that there's been prophets saying that there are certain places in America that are going to be safe houses for God's people, as God has always given. Now, where is your safe house, Brother Deckard? Because we want to know. And you know, I write them back and I say, well, I'll tell you where my safe house is. It's wherever I am. And I said, it works like this. It won't make any difference if I'm in Canada. It won't make any difference if I'm in Australia. It doesn't make any difference if I'm in California. And that great big earthquake comes. It'll make no difference because of the fact that, bless God, that, that I'll be in the right place at the right time. And if everything else goes, goes down to whatever it is, I just happen to be where I'm standing and won't go down there. And I said, that's the way it works. And let me tell you why it works that way. People are so concerned about somebody else hearing for, for God or from God for them that they, they miss some of the most important things about God. The God said that I will guide your footsteps. That's a promise. God will not guide a footstep that you take if, in fact, you're not keeping the commandments and, and, and the testimony of Yeshua. If you're not keeping, if you're not keeping uh, uh, Sabbath, if you're not keeping New Moon, if you're not keeping the festivals, I'm here to tell you, then you better be concerned that there might be somewhere on this earth you could go and hide. But I'm going to tell you something. God's got your number, and God knows where you're at, and God knows where you're going to be. And I'll tell you the other side of it. Bless God, there is no safety net for those who live out from under the commandments of God and the, and, and the testimony of Yeshua. There just isn't. Let's go to the book of Acts, the second chapter. Now, this is important because I, I got into some of this uh, uh, last time we met, and I said I'd go back and I want to touch on it again. Now, we know that when Yeshua left this earth, he told them that they were to go and they were to spend, uh, uh, after, after Passover, they were to go in the upper room and they were to spend those 50 days, okay, uh, those 50 days, the counting of the Omer, and after that counting of the Omer would come, would come Pentecost, and he said, I will send unto you the Rahakodesh. 
okay? Now, this is where everything changes. This is where trans- transition becomes, becomes uh, monumental in, in the lives of each individual person that will, from this point on, ever walk the face of this earth in the name of Yeshua. And the reason that it's so instrumental to us, before you saw the anointing of God work through prophets and a few kings, you saw the anointing of God work through the Son of God, you saw the anointing of God being transferred unto his disciples when he told them, I want you to go out and I want you to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, and I want you to raise the dead. But you did not see that happen anything past that time frame in which he told them to go do that. He was letting them touch, if you will, the miraculous. He was letting them understand what was about to happen to them on the day of Pentecost after he left this earth. He was getting them ready to receive and to walk into the miraculous. Now, on that day of Pentecost, it said on the second chapter, second chapter, first verse, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it uh, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then we turn right around, and in in the same chapter, we find out that Peter... Bless God, uh, he was, uh, you know, he was so turned on to this thing, and, and bless God that, that, that it was all coming down as, as they knew that it, the Lord had told him that it was coming down, that, that he decided that he'd go try it out. And of course, this is where he found the, the guy that was lame at, at the, on the temple steps, and he reached down and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. What did he have? He now had and possessed the power of God. He now was able, as the Spirit of God that was in him, making him in the image of God, now had been activated and he could now act as God acted. Just as the prophets, just as the few kings had acted in all the generations before then. There was never a man, a fisherman, a fisherman, Peter, could never have, Paul, the Pharisee, could never have worked the works of God in a time except after in which the Holy Ghost, the Rahakodesh, had come to this earth. But now God has now opened this thing up unto all mankind. He's now taken it. Now what happened through the ages? I'll tell you what happened through the ages. And as I said, and the thing that triggered me, and, and it's so hard that I begin to go back and begin to question over and over again and ask preachers, why do we not have the miraculous in our church services any longer? And it took me a number of years before I found out the reason that we didn't have the miraculous is because we had decided that we didn't need to keep Pesach we didn't need to keep the rest, of the, the rest of those festivals. We didn't need to keep New Moon, and we didn't need to keep, uh, didn't, didn't need to keep uh, a Sabbath. And that was the reason why. We had the tools. Did we not have the tools? Yes, we had them filled with the Holy Ghost. Did we speak in other tongues? Yes, we spoke in other tongues. But we had defiled God because you see over here with the blessing of which we had to receive it. And God said, unto all those that will come can receive this. Well, we received it, but the power did not and could not work because we had defiled God on the other end and become a curse to him. And now that the church has now, become, uh, has now come back full swing and back full turn back into it, now we're beginning to see and we're beginning to realize that now we now have the opportunity. We now will fulfill what God said on this earth to do. Now, does anybody have a problem with understanding that probably God knew what was going to happen to the church after the day of Pentecost and a few generations that passed by, then Rome come on and the, what, the, the losing of what we had with the, with the commandments. Yes, I believe uh, absolutely. I think that was all in God's plan. I think that was all part, do, part due, in fact, to the generation of the Gentiles in which God opened that door and said, there will be a time period of which they will come in. And which most of being the house of Ephraim, as I have taught you, uh, that would come in. So, so, now, so now, we have, now we're engaged. Now we, now we have not only the possibilities, but now we're acting like God acted. We're acting like Elijah acted. We're acting like Elisha acted. And you can see those acts throughout this book of Acts. In the fifth chapter, uh, the book of Acts, fifth chapter, in the 17th verse, fifth, uh, uh, 17th verse, 
It says, then the high priest rose up and, and, and they were with him, a uh, sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple of the people all the words of this life. Angel of God, come and open the doors. Did you ever see the angel of God come and open the doors to anything but the prophets before that? No. But now you can because now we have come into a new place. God transitioned. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the great Sanhedrin stood in their places. The bells jingled on their garments as they walked through the temple. But God had done something new. God had done something different. And these disciples was turning the world upside down with it. And they did up into the period of the Roman Empire coming in and then becoming Christianity themselves and thinking that they were and even still today believe they are. The fact of it is that God, God said, God said, God said that he would send the Rahakodesh back to this earth and he did that. Giving us the power to do it. Now in the 12th chapter, in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, and of course within this, and this can get a bit lengthy, but this was... Uh, the fifth verse, Peter had been apprehended, all right? They'd already put, uh, killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And, and the fifth verse says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, somewhere in the middle of all of it, and, 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 and the seventh verse says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, and said, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment upon thee and follow me. And he did. And as he went, the, the doors, the gates began to swing open on their own selves. Now listen to me again. Peter was not a prophet of God, found, anointed, and sought out after from being another prophet, now I realize you said, well, now wait a minute, they were disciples of, of, of Christ. Yes, they were, but they weren't prophets. They weren't, they weren't anointed to be prophets. We see them, we see them as apostles, all right? And you can say, well, that they had prophetic acts of all of them. Yes, you can. But what you need to again understand was that they were just doing now what God was about to let all mankind do, whosoever would come unto him. That's what that, and that's a principle in which the church, the believers are going to have to grasp onto in this last day of, of, of just understanding that that's exactly where God has brought us to. And we were there, we were there on the day of Pentecost, all right? And we lost all that, and now we're coming full turn, and we're swinging back to it, and we're now going to operate once again within it. Let's go to Acts 16. Acts 16. 25. Acts 6, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. There it is again, and there it is again. What is it all about? It's about a living God. It's about the miraculous. It's about the supernatural. It's about the walking out of the law that governs this earth, your five senses and your body, into a world that governs the supernatural realm where everything is possible. Again, you go back and you listen very closely what to Yeshua said, what Yeshua said, and he said, if thou can but, but believe, all things are possible to them that believeth. Now, he didn't say that ever once well. Now, why we can't do those things is very simple. The reason we can't do those things is because we are still trying to let our carnal mind, our carnal five senses govern the supernatural world. It just won't work that way. It never did work that way. Now, I can stand here and tell you from what I've experienced in 30 years that it has not been a bowl of cherries to, to, to bless God, to work the works of God, walking over into the supernatural law, leaving the natural law, because the whole time you're doing that, the, your, you know, the, the, your five senses, your mind, your mind is saying, you're about to make a fool out of yourself. You're about to make a fool out of yourself. 
You go ahead, you go ahead and call that deaf person, that deaf and dumb person up here. And when they don't hear and go back, these thousands of people that came, they're all just going to walk out. You watch, go. Does that ever change? No, and it will never change. And there's no reason to, for you to get to thinking that, bless God, just because you decide to walk over into the miraculous, that you're just going to waddle over there in it, and just because you showed up, now it's all going to work. As I've told you, I, th I think over the last the two or three tapes, maybe four tapes, you're going to have to begin to work in the small things and watch God do this little things, and then God will begin to give you bigger things. And it will work that way, but you have to start somewhere. And if you don't start there, it ain't going to work, okay? It's just not going to work unless you unless you'll start there. Now let me let me let me uh, let me uh, do this one. Uh, numbers of years ago, there was a young man that was a, a friend of mine, and and he and I used to hunt deer hunt together all the time, and he knew that I was a minister. Uh, uh, he didn't want anything to do it he, with it. He said he was a Catholic, and that's all he needed. And and uh, uh, so one night about two in the morning, the phone rang, and it was him on the other end of the phone. And he said. Would you come to town? He said, I've had a, uh, he said, I've had a motorcycle wreck. And he said, I think I broke my back. And I said, well, I said, where, where, where are you at? And he told me. So I said, yeah, I'll come to town. So I got, got up, got my clothes on, drove to town. I prayed on the way to town. Anyway, it, take, it took us 45 minutes to get him from just about from right here where this wall is to the, to the, to the door of my car to get him in the car. About 45 minutes. He was, in, he was hurting big time. Got him finally loaded up, got him headed down the road, and I was about a mile and a half from the hospital, the emergency room, and, and, and we were going down the road, and he looked at me, and he said, aren't you going to pray for me? I looked at him, I said, well, I said, has it come to that? I said, do you think you, I said, you, I said, you want me to, do you want prayer? I said, Vernon, this is a little unusual for you. I said, uh, you, you're the guy that didn't quite ever believe in all this, and then I said, the first thing that happens, you call me. He said, well, I, you're the only person I know of that ever, God ever did anything through. And he said, boy, if there's ever a time I need God to do something, it looks like it would be right now. So I just put my hand over his head and I said, God, let him be healed. Let him be healed. On the top of his head, down his back, I said, in the lung area, I could tell in my spirit there's something in the lung area. I said, let him be healed. Yeshua's name. Got him to the, got him to the emergency room and pulled up. And, and, and I remember him saying, I forgot to pray. And he said, is that all you're going to do? I said, well, that's all I need to do. I said, you know, what, what else you want me to do? Sprinkle a little holy water on you? I knew being a Catholic, maybe that'd help, you know. And, and he, he, he said, no. He said, I guess that's all. He said, I, I don't feel any different. I said, well, it don't work my feelings. So it took him 45 minutes to get him out of the car, uh, get him into the emergency room, get him to the x-ray room. And so the doctor come out, a little foreign doctor, and he come out and he began to explain to me. Now, see, I'm the only one there. He begins to explain to me. He said he had a back was broken in, in two or three places and that he had a, a punctured lung and maybe the other one was punctured. Couldn't tell for sure, but he did have broken ribs. And, and he said, he said, well, he said, uh, uh, he said, uh, we're, we're, you know, all this is going to have to be done. And he said, and about, about this time while he's talking to me with his back toward that door where they took my friend in, my friend's coming out that door and he's coming out and he's buttoned up his shirt. And he was walked over there. He stood there beside that doctor. And that doctor looked at him. That doctor said, oh, he said, you have to, you should be laying down. He said, uh, lying down. He said, what, what, what? He, you can't be here like this. And he said, oh, he said, you understand, doc. He said, somewhere between the time you took the x-rays and, and, and you come out here, he said, he said, God healed me. He said, this guy's a, a, a minister. He prayed and God healed me and I'm healed. That doctor said, no, 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 no. He said, he said, you don't understand. He said, he said, you got to go back and get back there because you got, and he would start going through this list of stuff. And, and so uh, Vernon said, no, he said, you understand, I'm going home. All right. So my friend, he, he went over and he, he got, his, uh, got his coat and, and he started out the door and that doctor got over in front of the door and he says, you can't leave. He said, if you leave here, he said, I'm going to be in big trouble because he said, I've got these x-rays. You've come in. We've recorded all this. And he said, uh, he said, you can't leave. I said, well, doctor, I said, listen, I said, it, would it be possible for my friend to go back and to do the x-rays again? And then if the x-rays are okay, you let him go home. And he said, yeah, he said, if that's right. But he said, that's not the way it's going to happen. He said, I don't know what, what's happening here. But he said, this guy, and he started down through this list. I said, well, Vernon, do me a favor, go back and have that done 
so we can, we can find out, you know, th- whatever. So Vern did, he w- went back and he had this done and he come back out. And so the doctor come out before he was putting his clothes back on and he says, you come with me. And so I went back into the, the thing and he put up the x-ray of the first one and there was the back broken and all the ribs broken and everything. And, 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 and he was just as white as the coat he had on. He said, I think you're the only one here that understands what's going on. Because he said, I don't. Because he said, look, look at this one. Put the other one up there, and there was not a thing on that other set of x-rays. And I looked at that doctor, and, 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 and I said to him, I said, this is the kind of God that I serve. Now, he was an Indian, uh, Indian and he was Hindu. And, and so, and I said, I would suggest, strongly suggest, that you take a long, hard uh, look at, at what a living God can do. And so anyway, uh, sure enough, uh, he left. Now, it was about two years later. Now, you, now let, me, let me tell you why. People always are telling me, said, oh, Brother Deckard, if you just come prophet and, and raise somebody from the dead or something happened, you'd get a whole city saved. No, you won't. No, no. Uh, see, seeing is not believing. All right, seeing. You remember what, he, remember what he said to Thomas? At least you cast your hand into my side and your fingers into, my, into the holes in my hand. You'll not believe. But blessed are those that don't see, that can yet believe. And, and so you thought that, that, that you know, this, this guy, this would have been it. Well, yeah, it was kind of it. That he acted like, you know, that maybe he'd get interested in the Lord and change his life. But you want to know something? It didn't last very long. He was back out in the world, and he was drunk and riding his motorcycle and acting crazy. One night about 2 o'clock in the morning, about probably about maybe two years after that, the phone rang. Now, I knew his wife was pregnant, and I knew that she was about to deliver a baby, and the phone rang, and he said he was crying. He said, Tom, you've got to come. He said, you've got to come with me to the hospital. He said, said they, I, said, well, I said, well, what, what are you talking about? Well, he said, they have flown my, my, my baby boy to, to Evansville, lifeline him down there because he said he can't live. I said, well, what's wrong with him? And I don't remember. He told me. And anyway, so I said, well, I'll, I'll come to town. So I came to town. And I went to the Evansville and, and, uh, with him, and we got down there. And the doctor came out and told him, said, well, the baby won't live till daylight. And they went through the things that was wrong with him. So I had, a, I had an anointing hanky with me, and I said, now, I said, now, do you trust me? And he looked at me, and he said, you're probably the only person on this earth that I trust. He said, whatever you do, looked at that nurse, he said, whatever he says, just do it. And I took out one of those anointing hankies, and you could see it was a little soiled. And I said, put this on the baby. Don't take it off. The baby will be fine. She said, oh, we can't do that. That's full of germs. And I said, didn't you say that baby was going to die before daylight anyway? Yeah, that's what the doctor said. I said, then how can that matter? She kind of looked at me. She said, well, I guess it doesn't. So anyway, well, the boy is 24 years old today uh, during this time. He's been to Iraq, been through all that over there, and he's alive and doing well today. Now, <clears throat> what does that say about a living God? It says that you have to go past the circumstances. You have to be understanding enough to look past. If you'll remember me talking about the fact that when God began to God began to deal with me and God began to tell me I had to first see those people that were lame, not in a wheelchair, not on crutches, not in body casts, but I had to see them without that and I had to see them walking. And he said you have to you have to see that first. And as I begin to talk to you, and we're going to do some, we're going to get into some of this stuff over that uh, 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 Friday night, Saturday, and, and Sunday uh, uh, seminar that we're going to have here in January. We're going to be begin to talk about the supernatural realm, the battle that goes on in the realm, and how it is that you must you must overcome. You have to understand that you're the overcomer. You have to understand that when it comes to miracles, that you're the only thing that stands going to stand between most people and death itself. And you have to understand that. You've got to be willing. You've got to be willing. Now listen to me closely. You've got to be willing to put your flesh under your feet. You've got to be willing to take the chance that it's going to take for you to be humiliated in order to work the works of God. But when Yeshua said, and all these that I, the things that I've done, you shall do an even greater work shall you do. He meant every bit of it. Acts 19, 12. 1912. And this piece of scripture here is probably something that uh, has uh, definitely gone around the world with me numbers of times. It says, 1912 of Acts, 
so that from his body were brought under the, under the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And so that from his body were brought under the sick. In other words, they took the handkerchiefs, these handkerchiefs, just like something like that, that, that he had on his body. Now, how did he have them? He could have them in his pocket. He could have carried them on him, put it, put it in his belt. Now, however it was to do. But it says the diseases departed from them, okay, and the evil spirits went out of them. And I can't tell you how many times that, that, that I have watched that work. Now, will that work for you? Yes, it will work for you. W- one, of the things, one of the things that we're going to do uh, during this seminar is, is we're, going to, we're going to hand out anointed hankies uh, that I'm going to anoint, uh, of which I will bring from India and Africa that I have used and watched miracles um, over there. I know when I get done in India and Africa, those in South America where the anointing's heavy, I take those handkerchiefs and I say, you put these away, put them in sacks. I want these marked, these, 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 these I want to use to hand out. And, and so I did that in accordance to the strength of the anointing that was upon me and by the miracles that came, all right? So, so we're going to pass those handkerchiefs out. I'm going to anoint them. I'm going to seal with oil people that will be in this room over that weekend. And the, the seal that I'm going to set upon them is a seal that's going to cause the death angel to pass over them. And you say, well, now, wait a minute, Brother Decker. Does that, what does that mean? Well, it's going to mean just, just this. The death angel is going to pass over through these play, this plague and the plagues that are coming after this plague. And there is a way to escape that. The way you escape it, number one, if you're going to keep the commandments and you're going to keep the testimony of Yeshua and you're going to put up food and do exactly what you're being told to, tell, uh, being told to do, I'll get it in a minute, then you're going to be safe from this thing. And all I'm going to do is, is put, a, put the oil upon you and, and cause the death angel to see the mark of God that's upon you. I'm going to put a mark of God upon you. That's what I'm going to do as a prophet. Now, is that big time stuff? Let me tell you, it's big time stuff enough that it'll fill all torrents before this thing's over of people trying to get to this prophet to get oil poured on them so that they will be sealed. There is a ceiling, and I'm about to, and I'm about to do that. And, and you know, I talked about that as I left all that oil over in Africa, and I couldn't understand why I'd had to take it to start out with, and the pain that was to get it there, and all you have to go through, the, all the. It was a real deal, and I said, God, what am I doing with all this oil? And He said, Take the oil. I took gallons of oil. Got over there, and I didn't use any of it. I said, let's leave it right there. You tell J-Los to take the oil and store it. And then all of a sudden I found myself telling J-Los, take the oil that the prophet anointed and go seal the peoples of Africa. Go seal them with a seal because that will take them through. The death angel will pass over them. That's the only way that they're going to survive. That's the only way they can survive over there is that that would happen, that it would take place. So the handkerchiefs, yes, we're going to, we're going to, so is that all part of? Yes, it's all part of. It's all part of me being able to do what? Start people into the miraculous. Because I will take these, anoint them, give them to you. You'll take them out and begin to use them. And you want to begin to use them. I don't care what it is. Use them. Is that going to last forever? No, it's not. It's going to last for a season. I'm not sure. I'm going to ask God to to tell me how long. All right? I'm going to to seek the face of God. See if God will let me tell tell all of you this is how long the anointing of these are going to last. Now, can you say, well, I could come back and get more. Well, you people are fortunate because you're around me a lot, all right? Those people that aren't around me, the people that I, that, and I did, this up in, I did this up in Milwaukee, and I did it in Phoenix. I'm going to do it everywhere I go. And people are going to understand the, the, the difference that this is going to make. Some of the reports that are coming back that they took the hankies, they laid them, and miracles were wrought for the hand of God. It's going to happen. Why? Because what God wants you to understand is living in the miraculous is a way of life. It's not, it, 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 bless God, it's not even, it's not, it's not a choice, it's a way of life. You, you, well, you've got to choose it, but the fact of it is, will it work? It's always worked. It's never meant not to work. But I hope that, I hope that through this study, I hope that you've been able to follow through with me. I hope you're able to understand what happened in the Old Testament. Why it was that you only saw the prophets and a few kings that actually possessed the power of God's anointing. And it was that way until, until the day of Pentecost. 
And after the day of Pentecost, that same power of the anointing was now, if you will, brought down, passed down, transitioned to the believers. And now we all have access. There's none of us that cannot work the works of God. The biggest reason we haven't been able to work the works of God is the church. Most of the church, bless God, most of the pastors, bless God, had no idea in this world how to work the works of God. No one had ever been. Most of the places, you know the places that I'm traveling in the United States, you know what they're coming and telling me? They've never seen the, the, the kind of the miracle types of healings. They've never seen that many of them take place at one time. Why is that? I'll tell you why it is. Because the church couldn't work the works. The church was afraid to work the works. The church was afraid. To, but I'm going to tell you again, and, and that, well, that's an important thing about this seminar that we're getting ready to do about come sit at the prophet's feet in January. The important thing of this is, is to understand that there are ways to command within the supernatural world, and you must learn to do that. And that's what God has given me the, the ability and the anointing to be able to do is to teach is to teach you how to take command in the supernatural, in the spirit world, because you have to do that. Your, your enemy isn't flesh and blood, never has been. Your, your big, the biggest enemy that you got is your mind. And once you're able to pass away from that part of you and get over into the supernatural realm, you will work the works of God. Until then, you're going to be tiptoeing through the tulips at best, and you're going to be out here pulling some things that, bless God, you're going to end up wishing you hadn't done. All right? Acts 28, 3. Acts 28, 3, and I think this is going to be the last piece of scripture that, I, I, that, I'm going to, that I'm going to use. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and had laid them on the fire, there came a viper, and that viper says snake in my margin, out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now, uh, the fact of it was, they knew that this viper, you read on down through there, the fourth verse said, said, and when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after that they looked a great while and so no harm come on him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, uh, again, nothing will harm you. Nothing will overtake you. Nothing can, is, it, none of those kind of things. You know, I, I go places and I've, I've been to places, I've been over into Madagascar and and, and or not actually in it, but just at the edge of it, where they had planted mines and they would take men and have men walk in front of me, uh, far enough in front of me from here to that door up there so that, and tell me that I was to walk and, and they had, they had the, their stuff on their feet that showed every place they walked and I was to place my feet in their feet. And I said, well, what are, you, what are we doing that for? And they said, well, because there's a minefield here and if they die, they're expendable, but we can't have the prophet dying. I said, I got news for you. You tell that boy to come back here and get behind the prophet. I said, I'll walk through that minefield and I can walk through anywhere there is on the face of this earth and it's not going to blow up and bother me because I said, I got news for you. I follow after the Holy Ghost, the Rahakadish. He doesn't follow after me. I follow after him. And I said, I will walk through that minefield. I will go through that minefield. And bless God, you, you know, and then we go other places in, in South America where they, 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 go, they want to go first and take sticks and, because we've got to walk through the jungles and the paths are about this wide and overgrowth is coming down and they got these what's called a, a two-step. The two-step snake, it's a little bitty old green snake, and bless God, you, 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 take, uh, you get bit by it, two steps and you're dead. It's over. And so they have people want to go up in front of them. I said, I need to tell them all get behind me. I said, I'm going to walk down through there. And I said, I said uh, there's no snake going to bite me. And I said, I'll, they'll, they'll, they'll skim her off. They'll go out, and out in the jungle. I said, just get behind me. I'll, I'll, you, I don't want them up there. I said, they're liable to get bit. Finally, one of the brothers said, well, prophet, wouldn't you just raise them from the dead? I said, well, yeah, I'd raise them from the dead. But there's no sense of me having to take time to be praying somebody be raised from the dead when all you got to do is just get behind me and follow me up through here. I said, that's all you got to do. And people said, well, well, I don't understand that. I'll tell you what. You need to understand that. You've got to understand something. That's the ways of our God. That's the way God does things. This thing, you see, the, the difference in this is that I learned how to step over into, into a world that the church doesn't know anything about anymore. The church in the book of Acts lived in that world. 
And I became so adamant about the fact that something was so desperately wrong with the church because we not only weren't working the works of God, didn't have to worry about the greater works, but we weren't even, in, we, I'm telling you, I go, go in those churches, Pentecostal churches, uh, the people that got more sick people in them than any church in the, in the country. You know why? They believe God can heal. That's a dangerous thing to believe a living God heals and attempt a living God because your doubt and unbelief won't rise up to enough faith to receive the fact that that healing didn't even come from that guy that's laying hands on you anyway. It came 2,000 years ago from the stripes that Yeshua uh, bore upon a tree. Can't even get that through them. Can't even, you know why? Because we've got too many preachers trying to play God. And it doesn't work. That doesn't impress God. And I'm going to tell you something else. It sure doesn't impress prophets. The only thing it does with prophets is it aggravates us. In fact, at some place, points it just downright makes me mad. To think that, bless God, that we have meshed around with people's lives. We're, we're, dealing, we're dealing life and death. That's what we deal and bless God, that you got preachers up there. Well, now, Brother Deckard, you know they got that one big church down there in Texas. You know, whole 60,000 people. They fill it up two or three times every Sunday morning. I don't care if they fill it up 12 times every Sunday morning. There's not enough anointing in that building to heal a sick cow. I know it, and they know it. And like I tell you, you let the prophet come, I'll bring the anointing in. But I'm going to tell you something else. The anointing's going to go right back out that door when this prophet leaves. And people might as well understand this. This thing isn't a game with God. God didn't set it up in a game. It's life and it's death. It's life unto those that can find it. The fact of it is, we found it. We understand it. The fact of it is, this thing is going to grow and it's going to explode. And I'll tell you why. Now is the time. Now is the hour that God is going to let the prophets bring forth a people out of the wilderness. And they're going to open up the oceans and bring fire down from, down from the heavens above. They're going to bless God, raise the dead. The blind are going to see. The deaf and dumb are going to hear and speak. The lame will walk. And it's not going to be something that's going to happen just every once in a while. It's going to be something that's going to happen time and time and time again. Why? Because that's the way God operates. Where God is, there's miracles. Do you know that? Where God is, there's miracles. And I have said for years, where is God at? Where is he at? If God is really here, there's miracles to be wrought. If God's not here, we're just playing games. And if all we're doing is playing games, you're not going to waste my time. I've wasted my time in too many dead churches. I'm not, I'm not interested, nor am I willing to be involved with a bunch of people that hope, that hope, that hope something may happen in their lives or in their physical being that bless God that they'll either live or they'll be healed or whatever that is. No, no, I don't have time for those kind of things. I'll tell you what I got time for. I got time for people and I'm finding them all over the United States. I found them all over the world that's excited about God and knows that God is about to explode on the face of this earth. That's what I'm after. That's what we're going to find and that's what we're going to celebrate. Amen. Stand up. We're going to pray.